Hello, Dale McDermott here with the CGLCC and welcome to the 2020 Digital LG BT Plus Global Business Summit. Before we get started on the session, CGLCC would like to recognize our presenting sponsor, TD Bank Group, along with all of our gold and silver sponsors and all of our sponsors for helping us to make this event happen. We would also like to recognize our translation partner, AI Media, for enabling us to deliver live caption translation in three languages, English, French, and Spanish, and you can access those using the links below in the description box. I'd also like to draw your attention to the left-hand side of your screen to the networking and exhibit hall tabs, where over the course of the next five days, you can connect with LG BT Plus businesses, corporations, and each other to help drive that power of connection. And finally, if you do like the content we are producing, please feel free to make a financial contribution using the donate link in the description box below. Thank you and enjoy your session.
Susan, you're ready to go. Okay. So shall I start now? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Well, um, pleasure to be here this afternoon. And uh, I'd like to just say I'm Susan Harper. I'm the Consul General, so head of the uh, Government of Canada office covering Florida, Puerto Rico, and USVI, uh, one of 12 consulates general in, in the United States, uh, and uh, one of 178 missions in 110 countries. So today, the topics that I'm going to be covering, um, per the request of CGLCC, uh, and in hoping that this is what uh, members are interested in, uh, three topics. One, how the Trade Commissioner Service can help you across the United States and across the world. Number two, the U.S. as a solid first export market for Canadians. And uh, specifically, I'll talk a little bit about Florida because that's the market that I'm in. And then third, um, that market and the impact of COVID. So uh, first, to start out, the Trade Commissioner Service, 120 years, it actually predated the Foreign Service. And, um, it, and you can see that we offer certain core services. And uh, what you want to do if you are looking to export at all, first, you need to know that you are ready to export. And that is something that you look at yourself and with other um, government agencies inside Canada. But once you are export ready, we in the offices abroad help you particularly assess the market potential and identify then qualified contacts. What we do, therefore, is basically provide practical advice on the market. And um, we all like to make sure that you uh, look at one of our key tools, which is Can Export, which is a program which financially assists companies, the SMEs, in the, um, and I'm, I'm noticing that my, uh, my presentation is not keeping up with me, so maybe I ask you to go to number uh, four now, um, Can Export. And if you meet the criteria here of can export, we can provide matching funding up to 75,000 for a project. These kinds of activities can be things like business travel, market research, participation at virtual trade events and fairs, adaptation and translation of marketing tools. So it's really quite useful funding if you um, uh, are eligible for it. And, uh, and I think uh, we have something like over a thousand SMEs who are seeking to diversify their export market who have tapped into this can export, which you can find under Canada.ca can export. And uh, you do need to apply a little bit in advance. We would suggest three months in advance if you're interested for in this using this tool. So that's a little bit about what we offer as trade commissioners. Secondly, in the area of why the U.S. is um, an obvious uh, first export market, next slide, um, Canada buys more from the United States than it does from any other nation. And uh, we are also the U.S.'s largest foreign supply of oil, natural gas, electricity. Our goods sold globally contain about 20% of, of American content. And um, Canadian goods uh, contain on average 20 to 25 percent American content. So what we do is we make things together. And because we are America's number one customer, they, we buy more from them than, than China or the entire European Union. We are well positioned as a partner. Next slide. Um, in 2019, the bilateral trade was over... 700 billion US dollars, which I guess is a trillion Canadian. And we trade about $1.3 million worth of goods and services every minute, which means in the course of this 45 minute presentation, we'll have done about $60 million worth of trade. So we are constantly trading and it is an important uh, relationship on both sides. Uh, millions of jobs. Um, and again, um, what that means is we are looked at as a very desirable partner. Um, 
Now, you are aware that there are border measures which restrict non-essential travel. Um, however, we, Canada and the United States, both recognize it is critical to supply, to preserve the supply chains. Supply chains include trucking, also travel for business in many, many areas such as medical care. And this, uh, cert this current measure on border restrictions is uh, at this moment extended to June 21st, and we'll be learning how that uh, the decision is taken by both governments, whether to extend or modify that border arrangement. But what's important for a business person to understand is that this supply chains that we have between the countries, the business that we do is seen as essential for both. Next slide, please. And uh, 80% of the US imports from Canada are goods that are inputs into goods made in the US. So again, that means Americans see us as key partners. And in Florida, for example, uh, Miami International Airport has certainly seen a decrease in the number of passengers, but we've seen an increase in cargo trade going through. So let me say a bit about the Florida market. The Florida market, uh, next slide, please. We have approximately 500 Canadian companies investing here. And you'll recognize some of the logos of some of the bigger companies that are listed here. Um, but um, it's not just that we have such an, a major investment. We are the number two in foreign investor in Florida. Next slide, please. Um, if you look at... Um, this is a slide from the Florida Chamber of Commerce, which notes that not only are we the number two investor, we are number one, not a surprise, international source of visitors, of tourists, but we're in the top three for uh, um, trade as well. And if you put these numbers together here in Florida, Canada is the most important international economic partner. And that is the basis for a lot of good business. And so that is what I can tell you about Florida, but it's true across the United States. We have this partnership. We have this tradition of making our products together and goods and services contribute to the trade in both directions and both sides of the border that's recognized. So what has happened to those supply chains during COVID? Next slide, please. Is that, uh, yes, obviously here in Florida, uh, the fact that uh, the snowbirds had to leave early in March um, and uh, they're very concerned about tourism. On the other hand, uh, there are many sectors that are very important still. We buy about 20% of uh, Florida's agricultural exports and we sell to them um, for agricultural exports. So we have interdependence in agri-food. We did, in fact, uh, in a couple of specific examples here, sell some health products during the uh, recent months of COVID. So we are continuing to see these supply chains because we are interdependent. And supply chains is really, and I'm doing my opening act for my colleague Darren, where we're gonna go next. Because when you see the next slide, you'll see that not only do we make cars together, next slide, uh, we make agri-food together, we make all sorts of things together. And I think it's important when we think about the USMCA to understand that whether you call it CUSMA or ASEUM the way we do in Canada or USMCA here in Florida uh, and the rest of the United States, this is about supply chains. Next slide, please. A last word on supplier diversity. Uh, we were very pleased last year when the US NGLCC had their big event in Tampa Bay and we are looking forward to the NGLCC event next year, 2021, in Fort Lauderdale. We have great linkages with um, not just the NGLCC, but here in Florida, Miami-Dade Miami -Dade Gay and Lesbian Chamber, the Tampa Bay Diversity Chamber, and the Pride Chamber in Orlando. And they would all be interested in talking to you if you're interested in partnerships. And I know this is true across the country with all the consulates. We always look for the partners who can help our um, diverse suppliers. Uh, we also have in Florida, as do most states, 
an office of supplier diversity and you can find out more about what they do. Um, we know that that is a great potential for certified um, NG, uh, NGLCC and CGLCC members. So um, thank you for the opportunity. Merci beaucoup. Uh, gracias a todos. And uh, let me turn it over to Darren. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Susan. Uh, my name is Darren Smith. I'm the uh, Director of the Services Trade Policy Division at uh, Global Affairs uh, Canada. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to speak at the uh, CGLCC uh, Business Summit. Uh, my part of this session uh, will focus on the Canada-US-Mexico or CUSMA agreement, which of course is the uh, successor to the uh, North American uh, Free Trade Agreement. Uh, first, I'll begin my presentation with an overview of uh, the general context surrounding uh, the COSMA negotiations before turning to some of the specific outcomes uh, with a focus on uh, cross-border trading services, uh, temporary entry uh, of business persons, and digital trade. Now, begin with an overview of the, uh, the context associated with the negotiations. Uh, I think it's worth recalling that the NAFTA modernization discussions were uh, quite unique. Um, it was the first large scale renegotiation of any of Canada's free trade agreements. And while FTA parties are normally looking to liberalize trade and in this, in, in this type of process, uh, the stated goal of the US at the outset of this negotiation uh, was to rebalance the agreement. Um, the president had also repeatedly threatened to withdraw from NAFTA uh, if a satisfactory outcome could not be reached. Uh, moreover, uh, the U.S. administration had taken the unprecedented step of imposing tariffs on imports of Canadian steel and aluminum, uh, as well as launching an investigation uh, that could lead to the same outcome uh, for autos and auto parts. So it was in the face of this situation that Canada set out to address uh, the following overarching objectives. First, to preserve uh, important NAFTA provisions and reinforce the security and stability of market access uh, into the US and Mexico. And second, uh, to modernize and improve the agreement uh, where possible. By and large, these objectives were achieved. The new agreement uh, maintains the NAFTA tariff outcomes ensuring continued duty-free access uh, into the U.S. and Mexican markets for originating goods. Uh, the CUSMA uh, outcome also preserves, importantly, the NAFTA Chapter 19 uh, Binational Panel Dispute Settlement Mechanism for Anti-Dumping and Countervailing Duty Measures, and it preserves the, the cultural exemption, providing Canada uh, with the necessary uh, flexibility to regulate in this area. In terms of, uh, of modernization, Aside from certain outcomes uh, related to trade and services uh, that I will speak to in a few minutes, uh, the agreement includes uh, the following. Uh, modernized disciplines for, good, uh, for trading goods and as well as in agriculture. Modernized obligations uh, for investment, financial services and telecommunications. And importantly, a new chapter on new chapters on labor and environment uh, where we have made important steps uh, by concluding uh, uh, chapters that are now fully incorporated into the agreement and subject to dispute settlement. And finally, uh, the outcomes advanced uh, Canada's interest towards inclusive trade uh, through greater uh, integration of the gender perspective, as well as the interests of Indigenous peoples. So now I'll turn to uh, some of the outcomes in relation to trade and services specifically. Here, uh, and I should say overall, market access commitments uh, amongst the three parties are commensurate with the original NAFTA. Uh, COSMO will ensure that Canadian services suppliers in most services sectors will be treated on an equal footing with domestic service suppliers in the US uh, and Mexico, and will receive equal or better treatment uh, with, uh, than their competitors from other countries. That said, there are some new features. Uh, compared with the original NAFTA, the new agreement includes, uh, importantly, a market access obligation, similar to how we um, address this matter in the WTO. And this prohibits the use of certain quantitative restrictions uh, to the supply of services uh, while complementing other provisions uh, of the chapter. We also have additional transparency provisions to cover licensing and qualification requirements and procedures, as well as an annex on professional services uh, that includes non-binding guidelines uh, to facilitate the negotiation of future mutual recognition agreements 
uh, in the professional services realm. The next area that I'm going to turn to is the temporary entry of uh, business persons. Uh, the temporary entry commitments in the original NAFTA uh, have supported North American economic growth and development through the facilitation of labor mobility uh, for certain uh, high skilled categories of business persons. These provisions eliminate many barriers encountered at the border, such as economic needs tests or quotas, in order to facilitate business travel or relocation uh, on a temporary basis for specific covered categories of business persons. This includes business visitors, traders and investors, intercompany transferees, as well as uh, professionals. The modernized temporary entry chapter in COSMA maintains the market access commitments negotiated under NAFTA. This means that workers and businesses of all three custom parties will continue to benefit from the same preferential treatment enjoyed since 1994. Now this outcome will ensure that Canadians uh, continue to benefit from the best access uh, into the US of any country in the world. Beyond market access, the chapter has also been updated to provide greater certainty and clarity around the application of temporary entry provisions it also refreshes the mandate of the, what's called the Temporary Entry Working Group, uh, to, which is uh, an entity for government officials uh, to discuss broader issues related to the temporary entry of business persons, uh, such as the processing of electronic applications. Now, there are two questions that we probably get the most with respect to the temporary entry uh, aspect or outcome of the negotiations. And first is, uh, will Canadians working in the U.S. under NAFTA be able to continue to do so? And the answer is yes. Uh, COSMA maintains the market access commitments that were negotiated under NAFTA uh, from, since 1994. The other issue that we get um, some questions on is about the list of professionals, uh, which, are, uh, uh, which have been in existence in 1994 and whether that list was updated. Unfortunately not. Uh, despite our strong efforts to secure additional access for Canadians, only an outcome that reflects the original NAFTA professionals list is what was able to be secured at this time. However, as I said, uh, the agreement does provide for the uh, continuation of the temporary entry working group, uh, which is an avenue for us to uh, explore new commitments in the future. And it's something that we have done in the past, um, going back to the mid 2000s, uh, where we've actually been able to modify a list of professionals through that ongoing uh, committee work. So the next area that I'd like to turn to is on digital trade. Uh, the digital trade chapter is actually a new chapter uh, in the, uh, the agreement. And uh, it's certainly um, one that will, or, uh, is receiving a lot of attention for the fact of not only the situation uh, under COVID-19, but of course, some of the broader changes that are taking place with respect to our economy. Uh, in our view, the, the new chapter will enhance the viability of the digital economy by ensuring that impediments to both consumers and businesses will be able to embrace this medium of trade and that their issues can be addressed. With respect to, uh, with, with, with specific exceptions, um, the chapter will prevent governments uh, in the cosmic countries from demanding access to an enterprise's proprietary uh, source code. The chapter will also include commitments uh, protecting and ensuring the free flow of information across borders. Uh, it prevents governments and cosmic countries from requiring the use of local servers uh, uh, for data storage. Uh, in addition, uh, there are commitments not to apply customs duties um, to digital products transmitted electronically, as well as to protect personal information and to cooperate on important security issues in electronic communications. Overall, the chapter will ensure that uh, Canadian companies, uh, especially small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, will be able to take advantage um, of the expanding online commercial uh, opportunities while also seeking to ensure an online environment that builds uh, consumer confidence uh, and, uh, and trust. Now, in terms of next steps, um, we're actually entering a, a very important part of our implementation process. Uh, in April, all three parties, this is past April, all three parties uh, provide notification of their readiness to implement the new agreement, uh, meaning that entry into force will be set uh, for July 1st, 2020. A considerable amount of work is being done to prepare for the implementation of the agreement, including with respect to uh, uniform regulations on rules of origin and certain elements related to uh, dispute uh, settlement. Uh, the, across the government, uh, there are uh, ongoing consultations with uh, stakeholders 
uh, including uh, Canadian companies to help prepare for the entry into force of the agreement. Uh, for those of you who are involved in uh, goods related trade, uh, the uh, CBSA um, has a number of, of important uh, uh, customs notices that are available with respect to custom implementation and can be viewed on their, uh, their website. Um, I'll also speak to obviously some of the challenges that are taking place right now. There, there's obviously uh, some challenges with respect to the, from the pandemic and um, there's uh, strong efforts being made to, to facilitate a smooth transition uh, into the new trading environment that'll come with the, with the, the, uh, the CUSMA. Um, but it's, uh, in our view, it's important to continue to move forward uh, to uh, ensure that um, we, that while recognizing the challenges that are inherent with this time, uh, the uh, Canada-US Economic Partnership uh, and bringing is obviously uh, quite important for the vast majority of Canadian businesses and bringing further stability into this uh, realm uh, will obviously be important from not only a short-term perspective, uh, but also for a long-term economic recovery efforts. Um, uh, that said, uh, once the agreement does enter into force into July 1st and building on some of Susan's uh, comments and, and her presentation, uh, there is uh, obviously uh, an important role to play that the department has to play in working with, uh, with yourselves to help promote and support uh, SMEs adopt to some of the new rules and the con context with, with respect to the, the new agreement. Um, not unlike our other uh, recent FTAs with the Asia Pacific, Asia Pacific and uh, Latin American countries that are part of the CPTPP, as well as our agreement with the EU, uh, there will be a variety of outreach events and activities taking place uh, with Canadian companies, whether it be seminars or trade commissioner service open houses, um, other types of training activities that will be put online um, uh, that will be uh, available for uh, Canadian companies to take advantage of. So uh, please uh, continue to monitor, uh, if you do, uh, the, uh, the, the Global Affairs Canada website and the activities of the trade commissioner service. Uh, whether it be through people like Susan uh, abroad uh, in, in, uh, in Florida or Miami, uh, the regional trade network across Canada or uh, officials that are located um, in, uh, in Ottawa. The last thing I just wanted to say though too is that uh, agreements such as COSMA uh, should be looked at as well as, as agreements that will be uh, where, where change will be possible, that these are evergreen agreements that we have institutional provisions to um, allow for um, further modernization to take effect. Um, and so getting feedback from uh, Canadian companies as to how their commercial activities are impacted by the agreement is certainly very important to us to ensure that uh, we're able to uh, defend your interests and uh, look at other ways to continue to expand our, our efforts. Um, and I should say too that when we're looking at our relationship with the US, and this will be my last comment, uh, we're also not restricted only to the uh, to the Cosma. They're obviously a partner of ours uh, that we work with closely in the context of the World Trade Organization. Uh, and in this multilateral area, there are other negotiations that are taking place, including on the digital realm. And so I would certainly encourage you, if you have an interest in this, uh, to um, look at our website and some of the information that pertains to our ongoing negotiations on digital trade in the WTO. Um, there's some uh, feedback that we'd definitely like to hear uh, from uh, companies that are participating in the summit, and I'd be happy to discuss this, uh, these, these types of niches offline with anyone who's uh, participating today. Thank you. I'm not sure if we should wait for the moderator, or uh, I noticed that there's already a question in the chat line. Um, I'm not sure if we'll be getting questions orally as well, but uh, um, should we, why don't I go ahead and address the question that's been raised already on the chat line. Uh, the question is, how has the landscape changed in the United States for Canadian companies, given the America First campaign? Uh, well, a couple of points. Uh, yes, protectionism is an issue. Uh, when I worked in Washington uh, in 2004 to 2009, protectionism was an issue. Buy America has been an issue all along. 
Um, we do have to always keep our eye on that at every level, uh, federal, uh, um, state, municipal, political. Um, yes, that can be an issue. However, I think it's also the reason that for me, it's important to recognize we make things together. Therefore, we have many business partners who are our natural allies. And we saw this throughout all of the last four years that I've been here um, working on the revision of NAFTA to bring in what Americans call the USMCA, um, because we had a lot of allies who knew that we were good partners and they need us in their supply chains. And so I think that one of the things that we have seen is that um, those alliances have been very useful. They were useful last year in fighting the steel and aluminum tariffs, for example, which um, are now uh, not eligible to be levied on Canadian and Mexican products after the negotiations. But we do have to keep an eye on it. But um, I think that's one of the things that's important is um, that companies who are ready to export uh, Canada does have credibility in, in many, of, not all of the states. We are, top, we are top suppliers, but we are also top customers. Um, you are not just selling to the government. You're selling and partnering with the private sector. And we do have a lot of credibility. And in fact, um, as people are talking about looking at their supply chains um, we have an advantage, both because we have this entry into force of this modern agreement, but because we are neighbors. People are looking at sourcing locally. Even the United States, people are recognizing they can't do it alone. And um, finally, uh, relationships. That's why I emphasize that we have partner organizations here who are already linked to the CGLCC. The NGLCC is working hard to bring in these connections. And I know the CGLCC did an excellent job when they were in Tampa Bay, bringing their export ready members to the B2B meetings. So those relationships, the quality of Canadian goods and services and the credibility we have in the business community, I think all help us to fight, yes, some elements of protectionism. Um, I. I think, uh, Darren, Darren, there's a question for you. Uh, shall I read it to you? Um, I think this is the one with respect to an LGBT uh, yes. clause. clause. Um, I don't think there's actually a clause per se. Uh, there is elements within perhaps, say, the labor chapter that speak to uh, certain minimum standards of treatment that, are, that need to be put in place. But if maybe the author of the question, I think it's Dale, could be more specific, I'll see if I can jog my memory. Um, what I can say, though, and, and unfortunately, I, I can't uh, speak to every specific page of the, the agreement. Uh, my focus was on uh, the cross-border trade and services chapter, along with digital trade and temporary entry. Um, but even in those areas, while I don't think we went as far as we wanted to in COSMA, we are trying to look at other avenues, especially with respect to the U.S. and other trading partners, uh, to incorporate uh, more inclusive trade ideas and, and firm commitments, in fact, uh, in terms of uh, our trade agreements. Uh, for instance, on the digital trade side, um, we are now actually consulting uh, with stakeholders on a um, commitment to address protection of personal information. And in the digital trade realm, maintaining confidence uh, with respect to your consumers is obviously quite important. And if governments and different jurisdictions are starting to require uh, businesses to uh, turn over um, sensitive information uh, on the basis of, uh, of sexual orientation or uh, religion or ethnicity, uh, they could obviously have um, uh, uh, an impact uh, both in, from a commercial perspective, but also uh, broader. So there are things like that that we're taking, uh, certainly to take a look at. Um, and I'm just looking at the question right now. Yeah, so I think this again, this is the, uh, this falls uh, within either the labor chapter or the preampler chapter. I can't unfortunately give too much color to that. Um, uh, to that point, 
Um, as I said, I think that uh, we did try to use this agreement uh, to uh, modernize um, as much as we could the relationship that exists between the three parties. Uh, and that includes uh, uh, capturing um, some of the uh, very important uh, areas around the inclusive trade agenda that have been developing over the course of uh, the last uh, couple of decades since our agreement entered into force. So we have a start uh, with respect to uh, the inclusion of some of these ideas and concepts in the agreement, uh, but clearly uh, more can still be done. And as I said, the agreement is evergreen. We still have the opportunity to continue uh, trying to advance uh, some of this, um, uh, these important objectives as the agreement uh, moves forward in the future, as well as through other forms. And I see I have a message from Jordan. Um, uh, let's see here. Yes, and so the agreement does allow for other changes and updates going forward. Uh, the COSMO, like uh, other trade agreements, has institutional provisions. So we have basically committees and working groups that are established to continue discussions uh, and to find um, additional ways in which we can improve our commercial relationship through new rules and potentially market access. So, um, uh, and obviously uh, there are things that we have uh, done in the context of 2019, 2020, that we uh, can't foresee what will things will may go in, in you know, five or 10 years time. So we have those kinds of built-in mechanisms to um, uh, make further modifications. There are challenges, of course, uh, through domestic ratification procedures to do that. Uh, but in many cases, there are things that we can do without having to go back for congressional or parliamentary approval uh, and to make the agreement uh, more responsive to the needs of uh, our respective uh, stakeholders. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of questions. Maybe I could uh, just throw out another couple of ideas. Uh, presumably, if people are watching this, uh, it's because they are interested in looking to export and perhaps invest outside Canada. I, I would, uh, again, underline, we recognize that, uh, and we saw this when CGLCC came down to the NGLCC um, uh, summit last year, uh, not all members of CGLCC are interested in international uh, markets, and frankly, not all are export ready. And it's true that a company has to be ready to take the jump to go to a new market. But it's such an obvious first market, the U.S., and I think that that kind of thinking will help you look at the U.S. market first, as most Canadian exporters have done over time. That's why our economies are so intertwined. It's an obvious first market. And there are many groups who are uh, well stationed to help you first get ready to export. But second, once you are ready, again, we have 12 consulates general and 16 trade officers offices across the U.S., we are, as Canadians, well positioned, even in a market where there is greater protectionism, but there is also a great opportunity right now because of the challenges that economies are having in recovering from the impact of the COVID. People are looking to do business, and we are obvious close neighbors and partners. A lot of people are now very focused on the trade and security linkages. For example, health and security. We were there and we are exporting products to the United States and making things together. Uh, energy security. We have long been the, the big partner for the US in energy. And third, uh, agricultural, ag agriculture and food security. Those kinds of issues are at the forefront uh, for the governments, but also um, at, at, the at the state and federal level. But also, I find here in Florida, and I'm sure this is true across the U.S., people, uh, business people are looking for opportunities, and good partners can provide good opportunities. So this is a time to, if you're ready to export, look at the opportunities that this obvious first export market can offer you. 
Um, are we to work with the, uh, okay. Do we, do you see any opportunity for a virtual trade mission this year? Um, uh, oh, it's Tim. Hi, Tim. Um, uh, yes, I do. I think we are all looking for ways to do business in virtual ways. And I'm already seeing different opportunities. And this uh, event is one of them. Just the fact that we are able to speak to you uh, who are uh, nowhere near uh, my house where I'm speaking from just underlines the opportunities that are going to come up. And I think we are looking for ways to do virtual trade shows and virtual trade missions. And I've been very impressed with the organization of this event. So I would love to see a partnership with the CGLCC on something like that. Um, so yes, there are opportunities. Are we to work with multiple trade commissioners or once, or is it best to just work with one at a time? I think it makes sense for most people to tackle a market at one time. Uh, I think uh, this is a huge, I mean, Florida alone, we have the, we're the third most populous state with uh, about 22 million. Um, uh, so uh, the, big, the big areas, big markets alone can give you great potential. I think, uh, again, it depends on whatever your product, your good or your service is. But it certainly makes sense to look at the specific regional market in the U.S. because they are so different. I mean, for example, why do we have so much agricultural trade in, with Florida? Obviously, because we're countercyclical. There will be other areas as well, different high tech. Here, defense is about 10 percent of the economy. There are a lot of military bases in Florida for all sorts of reasons. Well, those sectors are quite active and we saw... Um, one of the um, members of the CGLCC um, delegation last year had an incredible product, which was of interest uh, to them um, in the energy field. We, we, there are regional advantages, and I think it's what's sensible for your company and the size of it and your product or service. Do you, what do you think the future holds in post-COVID economy for exporters who do business in the U.S.? One of the realities is most people, for example, in Florida, when they're doing business with a Canadian company, they really have no idea. They don't know what the initials TD in the bank or BMO in the bank stand for. They have no idea. And that's because Canadians are not as prone to flying the flag as some other nationalities, which in the current context can serve well. Therefore, they're judged on their commercial quality and credibility. So I think that the post-COVID economy for exporters who do business in the U.S., we are going to need partners here. And Canada is the obvious set of partners. One minute left in the session. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you. Merci beaucoup. Gracias. Et hasta la próxima. A la prochaine. And I'd also like to say thank you as well. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, present today.